Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. When we get to celebrate baptisms together as a church family, that's exactly what we're celebrating. That a person has recognized their sin, they want to die to that sin. We uh, show the picture of them being buried in baptism and raised, not just to go back to the old way of life, but to walk in the newness of life with Christ in us. And that's what we get to celebrate together today. Thanks. This is Hayes Moore. Um, Hayes came and talked with me a couple weeks ago, and we just kind of talked through what God was doing in his life. Hayes was um, baptized as a child, but said more recently, maybe in the last few years, he's really felt a difference in his life. He knows what it's like to have Christ uh, living in him and to know what it's like to have the Spirit uh, dwelling in him. And he wanted just to uh, be baptized to get that in order to make that known to his church family. To let you know what we just read in Romans 6, that he wanted to be buried with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. Hey, have you repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus and him alone to save you? Are you seeking to follow him daily? And hey, do you commit to the end of your life to continue in the power of the Spirit walking after him? Well, based on your profession of faith, my brother, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful that we get to celebrate again um, another baptism here as a church family. And we get to rejoice in what you're doing in the lives of children and students around us here in Selma. And we just pray that these uh, that we've baptized in the past few weeks and Hayes today might be a spark that continues revival in our schools, in our cities, spreading to our nation and the world. Father, let us be a part of that. And I pray today that if there's any here who have decided recently to follow after you, that want to seek you and, and be a part of uh, your body, that they might recognize today their need to, to repent and believe, to follow you in baptism. I pray that you would pierce their hearts for that. Lord, be with us in the remainder of our services. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One day, a lady named Phoebe Knapp, her husband was the founder of New York Life Insurance, came to Fanny Crosby, the hymn writer, the poet, the hymn writer, and uh, she had uh, learned or uh, written a, uh, a tune. And she came and she played it for Fanny Crosby and, she, and uh, asked Fanny Crosby, tell me what this hymn says to you. So she played the tune to Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And Fanny Crosby, always being quick with words, she said, oh, that tells me that blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory of God. And that is the origin of the hymn. Hymn number 446, blessed assurance. Let us stand and say, I'll first that. <laughs>
Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. What a glorious morning our Lord and Savior has given us to be in this place this morning. And we want to thank you all so much for making First Baptist your place of worship this morning. And uh, we hope that your worship experience here is just a wonderful, wonderful one. If you are tuning in by way of our live stream or our radio broadcast, I want to thank you so much for being a part of this service in that way as well. And if you're visiting with us, thank you so much for making First Baptist Church uh, your choice of worship place this morning. We encourage you to come and be with us at, at any, any time. If you do us a slight favor this morning as the offering plate is being passed, it's a little section in there. If you'll fill that out for us and drop it in the offering plate. Just allows us to be able to make contact with you and just kind of let you know what's going on here at First Baptist Church. Please join me in prayer. I hear Father, we just once again, we just thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to be in this place this morning. And Lord, we just continue to ask that your hand be upon all of us, Lord, in the work that you want all of us to do. Lord, may we just be faithful in that work. Lord, we just ask that you be with um, any of our church family right now that may be dealing with situations or circumstances in their life, Lord, where they just need maybe a healing touch. Maybe they just need for you just to give them a sense of calm and understanding that you are there with them right now, Lord. Lord, we just thank you so much for the love that you give to us, all that you do for us, and we ask your continued blessings upon this church. Lord, just be with us as we continue to go about this hour this morning, and may all that we do here, Lord, just be honored and praising to you. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for this opportunity, and it's all this we ask in your name. Amen. <coughs> Hymn number 339, hymn number 339, Standing on the Promises. We certainly can't do it sitting on the premises, so I stand as we sing all for a stand. <laughs> Oh, 
Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the many blessings you've given us. We thank you for sparing our state this past week as far as this hurricane that hit the country. Thank you for keeping us safe and protected. We ask that you'll bless the states that were impacted by this storm. Bless them and help them in their recovery efforts. Keep them safe from harm. Be with the families that lost loved ones during this event. Give them comfort and grace in the days ahead. We ask that you'll continue to bless our country. We know it's fractured, it needs healing. We ask you'll lay your healing hand upon our nation. We ask that you would continue to bless Brother Tim as he and his family as they lead this congregation at First Baptist. We thank you for the Newsoms who join us today. We ask them, I ask that you would bless them in their ministry to the youth. We pray for the many missionaries we support and ask that you would bless them, be especially today with Timothy Fowler, our missionary who's witnessing to the people of Arizona and the Southwest United States. Bless him today on his birthday. We ask that you bless these tithes and offerings we're about to collect. Use them to your glory. We ask these things in thy name. Amen.
Please stand like that. There we go. Okay, good job. All right, good morning, everybody. We've talked a lot about how people train for various things. For example, we talked about double dutch jump roping and how you have to stay focused. We talked about learning how to whistle and being in a whistling contest. And for a whistling, you have to have good ears and you have to stay on pitch. And then last week, we learned that we have to be dedicated if we're going to practice for a yo-yo competition. The term basic training, does anybody know where that comes from? Have you ever heard that word before? Basic training? Anybody? No? It's actually a military term. It means it's a period of time where people undergo a physical and mental change. They'll face fears, they'll learn how to work as a team, they become really tough and strong and resilient, and after all of that challenging work, they will become an American soldier. Basic training is not easy. The basic training of becoming a Christian and growing in a relationship with God is hard too. The Bible is our tool for life, and we need to train ourselves to stay focused and connected with God through our prayers, and we need to keep our ears open and listen to God's voice. We also need to connect with friends who love Jesus and take the time to serve others. A wonderful way to serve others is by participating in Operation Shoebox Ministry. Helen Ann, can you show everybody our shoebox? You know what we do with this, boys and girls? What do we do with We put shoes in it. It does look like a shoe box. If we can put some shoes in there. Perfect. We put a bunch of stuff in it and send it around the world. And as we begin to train ourselves to love Jesus as he loves us, we become solid Christian soldiers who begin to share the good news to others. And that's what we're going to do through the shoe box ministry. So let's bow our heads and pray to be good listeners and givers. Dear Lord, we thank you for the Bible that gives us a mindset and, a, and give us a mindset and a discipline to pray and help us read our Bible every day and reflect our actions in your image. Amen.
your copy of God's Word and open with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. As we continue in our series, our nine-week series called Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. Last week, as we started this series, we said that a mark of a healthy church was dependence on God's Word. That everything we do, everything we believe, that every, uh, every action we take or conviction we have is solely based on God's Word. How that guides us. And therefore, we sing it, and we preach it, and we pray it, and it's what we revolve our Bible studies around. Um, and everything that we do, because that is God, how He communicated to us, and it's the only way we can know Him and know what He has asked of us. And so today, as we continue this series, we're looking at Mark number two of a healthy church, which is this, biblical theology. Mark two of a healthy church is biblical theology. Now, I know theology can be a scary word to some. It's a big, fancy seminary word that I don't worry about theology, just, uh, just me and Jesus, right? But theology simply means what you believe about God. Right, and so we all have a theology. We all believe something about God. And in fact, every person who lives has a theology. They believe something about God. Now, it might be that they believe there is no God, but that's their theology, right? And so if a church is going to be healthy, we can't have 200 people with 200 different theologies, right? We can't all be believing different things about God. And so if we need to believe there's one true thing about God, and there is, then where do we find that truth? How do we know out of all the different things we can believe about God, out of all the different things people out there believe about God, how can we be sure that our belief about God is true and orthodox? And, and the answer to that is it must be biblical. Now the case for that can be made in last week's sermon. So go listen to that if you weren't here. But the truth is that God has spoken to us and revealed uh, about himself to us. And therefore, if we are going to be healthy as a church, and if we're going to be healthy spiritually as Christians, our theology can't just be what we want it to be. It can't just be that, oh, I would like to think about God this way, or in my perfect world, God would act this way, or uh, this, this picture I've conjured up in my mind based on my experience is something about God. It has to be uh, grounded in truth. And that truth being God's word to us. This is the case because words matter. Right? We would all agree that words are important. Have you ever been in a discussion with someone and you realize you may be using the same words, but you're using a different dictionary. Right? You, uh, you're, you're using the same language, but you mean different things when you say words. Maybe you've been on a mission trip to a foreign country and they've asked if you want to play football and you're like, oh yeah, I'm ready to go, right? Get your hands ready to catch it and they kick a soccer ball to you. Because words matter in different contexts. In different contexts, different words mean different things. And so it's not enough. It's not enough just to say, oh, I believe in God. Well, Probably a majority of our country would say that. It's not enough to say, I believe in Jesus. Because a lot of the country would say that. You see, if we just kind of give these general big picture statements, uh, we are lumping ourselves in with billions and billions of other people who would all say, not just in our country, but around the world, yes, I believe in a God. Just to give you an example, if, if you were to have just a surface level conversation with a Mormon, um, you'd probably walk away from that conversation going, hey, we believe in the same thing, right? They believe in God the Father, we believe in God the Father, they believe in Jesus, we believe in Jesus, we both believe Jesus is God's Son, we both believe Jesus can save us. If you just kind of go on a surface level conversation without some context as to what they believe and what you believe, what the Bible teaches, what the Book of Mormon teaches, you might walk away and go, hey, we're on, the, we're on the same team. If you dig deeper into what they believe and what we believe, we, we could not be farther from one another. But you can't get to that conclusion 
just with a service level conversation. You can't get to that conclusion just by using generic terms and generic ideas. We have to know what the Bible says about God. We have to know what, what God has told us about himself. Because like we said last week, the only way we can know about God is if he revealed himself to us, which he did. And so when we talk about thinking about God, when we talk about theology and what we believe about God, we're not thinking about what we like to think, but more about exactly what does the Bible tell us. If we begin to fade on this topic, we, we begin to uh, go, well, I wish God was this way. When we begin to build God in the image that we desire him to be, then we begin to create him in our image and in our likeness like we want him to be with our characteristics and our traits because we think we know better. And when we begin to fade, it's typically because uh, people in our culture today, there's this mass rise of progressive Christianity, what they would call themselves. There's this rise and the, the number one talking point amongst that group would be Jesus is all about love. And so we have to love everyone and accept everyone. And that was the message of Jesus. But what we have to realize is that love your neighbor as yourself was the second greatest commandment, right? What's the first greatest commandment? To love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so uh, we must first have an appropriate understanding of who God is and love Him, not as we like to think of Him, but as He tells us about Himself. Only when we do that appropriately can we then love our neighbor. Any love that we give our neighbor that's not grounded first in the love of God is a false love. We can't truly love our neighbors without loving God, and we can't love God without knowing what's true about Him. So if we as a church want to love our neighbors well, and if we as a church want to go to the world with the gospel, and if we as a church want to reach youth and children and adults in our city, we must first have a grounded theology in what God has told us about Himself. So with that in mind, I want us to look at five foundational truths about God that we must cling to from the Word if we're going to be a healthy church. Five foundational truths that we need to, to cling to and, and not only know what's true, but know the implications of that truth. Because this is true, there are things that are also true based on that. So let's look at those. Now, number one, God is the Creator. Therefore, he has authority over all things. God is the creator. And because he's the creator, he has authority over all things. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You see, the Bible doesn't, it doesn't see the need to prove the existence of God, right? God has just assumed they are in the beginning because God has always been. Um, the Bible doesn't deal with the origins of God or, or the kind of this metaphysical argument of is there a God? The, what's true about God is plain to us in creation. We know that there is a God. And so this, the Bible is seeking, is God seeking to tell us about himself. And what he tells us at the very beginning is that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And without going through all the days of creation, we know that God forms and fills. He forms the ocean, and he fills it, and he forms the sky, and he fills it, and he forms the earth, and he creates humans in his image, and he, he fills it, he puts vegetation, and uh, he, he does all these things. He separates the water from the land, and the water above from the water below, and, and all this that God does. And here's what I want us, here's what we need to understand. Here's the key importance for us in this truth. Because God is the creator, that gives him the right to demand certain things of his creation. There are people out there that would say, what gives God the right to tell me what's right and what's wrong? How can he tell me what I should do with my body or who I should love or how I should treat other people? Uh, what, what gives him the right? And the answer is, he created you. When you create something, when you name it, it gives you authority over that thing. When you create a masterpiece, a work of art, right? you get to decide what you do with that. Or you sell it, you hang it up, you, you give it to somebody, you donate it to somebody. God creates us in the whole earth 
And he has the right to demand certain things of us. And so in his word, he does just that. He, he lays out his law. He started it with Adam and Eve. He says, uh, you, you can eat of all the, uh, the fruit and all the trees of the garden. You can enjoy all of this that I've given you except this one tree, the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat of that one. And then as the story goes, we know they eat, they sin. Uh, humanity is thrown into sin. Brokenness enters the world. And then what we see over time as God continues to progressively reveal himself to us is he lets us know the standard by which we are to live. He lets us know the standard by which we will someday be judged. And what we need to recognize and what we need to help people recognize is the reason he can do that is because he is the giver of Life. The Creator has the right over the creation. So we are not our own. The, the biggest lie of, uh, of the American uh, kind of uh, push away from Christianity, away from uh, spiritual things, is that I'm, I'm my own person and I can do whatever I want because it's my body and it's my decisions and nobody should be able to tell me what to do. I guess what? That's not how life works. We're all under someone's authority somewhere along the way, right? When you're a child, God gives you parents to be in charge of you and to put over you. And then there's, uh, in your workplace, we always have somebody we're answering to. There's always a boss all the way up. I remember having this conversation with, with one of the kids, and they were like, what about the top boss, right? What there's usually a board of directors somewhere that they're answering to, right? It's just this kind of circle of authority. We're always answering to someone. We're always under authority. And God is our ultimate authority. And that leads us to number two. So God is the creator. Therefore, he has the right to demand things of us. But number two, God is just. And therefore, he punishes sin. God is just. And therefore, he punishes sin. First Peter chapter 1. You see, God created us. He, he gives us his standard. And because God is holy, um, totally set apart, uh, God can't sin, right? God can't lie. God is perfect, holy, set apart is the picture that the scripture gives us. And so therefore, he has the right to demand something of us, which we see here. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Peter is, um, is kind of looking back to the Old Testament. Let's start actually in uh, verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy as I am holy. You see, God is holy. And the standard that he has put on us is holiness. The standard that he has put on us is perfection, that we might not sin. We look at the laws of the Old Testament, and those laws are meant to show us that we can't live to that standard, because there's no way we could follow them all. That you couldn't do it. And the, the scriptures tell us when you break one, you're guilty of breaking them all. And so we are sinners in need, um, or we're sinners, and therefore we deserve punishment. And God is a good God. God is just. He, he doesn't just turn a blind eye to sin. We talked about this in my social class this morning, that God isn't that fun uncle that we have, and everybody's got one, that, that you break something, and they're like, oh, let's just sweep that under the rug. We won't tell mom and dad. We'll, we'll have that extra piece of candy. I know they said no sweets or whatever, but, but here, just take this extra piece of cake. You're good. We don't have to let them know, right? And sometimes that's how we view God. Oh, God is just so loving that when we sin and we don't meet his standard, he just, he just pushes that to the side. He just pretends it didn't happen. He just sweeps it under the rug. But that is not what the scriptures tell us to be true about God. What the scriptures tell us to be true is that the standard is holiness and we are required to live up to that or there is punishment. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says this, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without uh, sins being paid for, they don't just automatically go away. Sins don't just automatically disappear. We have a government right now trying to do like a lot of debt 
forgiveness, you know? Like, oh, you've got this big pile of debt, and we'll just throw it out as if it never happened and nobody's ever going to pay for it. That, that's not how life works, right? And that's not how uh, sin works either. We have this big sin debt because God has required holiness of us, and he doesn't just toss that out. Think about in the Old Testament. God required Israel to do a, a, a atoning sacrifice, this yearly atonement sacrifice. And you see, that was so contrary to pagan religions at the time, because pagan religions uh, just would do sacrifices when things were going bad, right? Like, oh, we're being invaded by an enemy, or a, a, a terrible storm comes, we, we can't explain it. We must have upset the gods, so we need to do these sacrifices to make ourselves right with God, and when things get good, then we're fine, and we can just keep on going. But you see, God required yearly sacrifices of his people as a way to say, it doesn't matter if the circumstances in your life are good or bad right now. It doesn't matter if things are going your way or not going your way. It doesn't matter if you've had plenty of harvest or no harvest at all. You always need an atoning sacrifice because you're a sinner. And the standard that God gives is holiness. And you see, there are theologies out there. I, um, I, um, I mentioned this a minute ago. They're seeking to totally remove the justice of God in favor of the love of God, which is going to be our next point. We're going to get to that. But before we can fully understand the love of God, before we can fully understand the weight of what he did for us, we have to realize that the reason that is so significant is because God is a just God that is going to punish sin. And without the shed of blood, there is no remission of sin. So without a sacrifice, without something to atone for our sins and to make us right with God, we will be judged by him because he's a good judge. Mark Dever says we should never try to change the gospel for it to be more pleasant. The God of the Bible is a holy God, and no gospel that ignores God's holiness is the true gospel. See, the good news of being saved isn't good news unless there's bad news. If it's good news behind good news, you're telling people, hey, you're, you're, you're a good person, you're pretty much okay, and God loves you. It's like, well, why do I need salvation, right? If, if I'm not lost, why do I need to be saved? I, I heard an evangelist say once, if I had an hour to share the gospel with somebody, I would spend 50 minutes getting them lost and 10 minutes getting them saved. Right, because the good news of the gospel isn't good news unless you know the bad news. And if we try to remove the justice of God, then there's no more bad news. And the good news doesn't sound as sweet. But that brings us to number three, the third kind of foundational truth that we want to, we need to cling to if we're going to have a biblical theology, a biblical understanding of who God is. Not only is God the creator, so he can demand things of us, and not only is he just, therefore he punishes sin, but number three, God is love. Therefore he sent his son. You see, at the same time, God can be fully just and fully holy and to demand uh, purity and righteousness and perfection out of his creation because he has the right to do that. And at the same time, he can love us so much to do something about it. And you probably don't even have to turn here, right? But John 3, 16. It's the low-hanging fruit for this one, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Why would, why would God do that? Why would God send his son for sinful humanity that has rebelled against him? Right? We have sinned willfully, sinned. We have chosen to run away from God. We are his enemies. Look at Galatians uh, chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Should have given you a heads up. A lot of flipping here, so you know I'll write these down. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. You see, at the right time, God sent Jesus. And when was that right time? Was that right time once we got it together, once we figured everything out, and once we cleaned ourselves up, got up and dusted ourselves off and uh, uh, tidied up, and then God sent his son? No. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says this. 
But God showed his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Christ came, God sent his son to die for us, not once we got it all figured out, not once we were his children, but while we were still sinners, while we were still his enemies, while we were still against him, God loved us so much, even as those who cursed him and hated him, that he sent his son to die so that we might be adopted as sons. Because God is just and he has to punish sin. And so Jesus came to take that sin for us, to take our sin debt, to pay our penalty. And so this isn't debt forgiveness, so we'll just pretend you never uh, borrowed all this money that you couldn't pay back. No, this is somebody coming along and saying, hey, I have the means to pay for it, so your debts are paid. Jesus pays the penalty for our sin, so we don't have to, because God is love. So we're not trying to minimize God's love that uh, that false teachers out there are trying to make the only thing. We're just trying to say that there are other things true about God as well that are equally as true. God's love isn't the most true thing about him and everything else is a secondary truth. All of these things are equally fully true about God. He's the creator. He's just. He's loving. And one of my favorite few verses of scripture, Romans chapter 3, verse 25 through 27. Romans chapter 3. I think I wrote the wrong record, so let me look. All right, write this down wrong. I apologize. In Romans, it talks about uh, God being the just and the justifier of our sins, right? He is the just one. That punishes our sins. I'm sorry I don't have that reference for you. Uh, he's the just one that covers our sins, and he's the just fire. He's the one that makes us right with God. So not only does he impose a penalty on us, but then he pays for that penalty as well. He does both parts of the job, not just one part or the other. And so any gospel that demands holiness without the love of God are equally as egregious to the ones without justice. You see, we can err on both sides. There are some people that don't want to talk about the love of God at all. They just want to say, you've got to do this, do this, do this, and be right with God, and God is holy, and you've got to walk holy. And if you're not walking in holiness like He is, then you are doomed without. You're, you're doomed. And they never want to talk about the love of God. That is equally as egregious as those who do the opposite and say, hey, God's loving, and He accepts everyone, and there's no punishment or justice or judgment coming. So God is the creator, God is just, God is love. Number four, God is kind. Therefore, he gives us an opportunity to respond. God is kind. And he gives us time, he gives us an opportunity to respond. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 say this, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same thing. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet you do them yourselves, that you will escape the judgment of God? Verse 4, here's our key verse. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness that God, that hit him, sorry, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. You see, the fact that God doesn't wipe out humanity at any given moment because of our sin, which is what we deserve, is Him being kind to us. It's Him giving us time. It's Him giving us an opportunity. I heard someone talking within the past week or two about how you know, sometimes they go, Lord, I just wish you'd come on and, and, and just end it all and bring us and let us be back with you and, and all this pain and suffering will be over. And the person said, then I realized, you know, there are lots of people out there who still haven't yet repented and believed. And God, every moment he doesn't come, is going to give them another moment to do that. It's God showing his kindness to unbelieving humanity. 
And so God is kind and he is waiting and he is offering that invitation to each person that that, that person recognize and realize that they have sinned and they are separated from God. But that God loves them enough that in his justice he would send his son to pay for their sins. And it's simple. Our response is simple. Acts chapter 10. Starting in verse 9. I said Acts, I think it's Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Starting in verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then verse 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then in Acts chapter 3, uh, Acts chapter 3, Peter is preaching to a group uh, right after Pentecost or at Pentecost. And uh, Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 17, Peter says, And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things from which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. You see, in God's kindness, he's waiting to return. In his kindness, he's waiting to bring about that final judgment, which will come because he's a just God. So he will bring that final judgment. But in his kindness, he's holding back so that sinful, fallen humanity has the opportunity to respond. And in those passages we just saw, what that, all that takes is repentance, it's turning away from your sins, recognizing you have sin, recognizing that God is a standard that we don't meet, and he has a right to put that standard on us, and that if we continue to walk separate from him, we will die separated from him. But that because he loved us, he sent his son to bring us back into a relationship with him, and the time is now that you can repent of your sins, turn away from that, and put your faith in Jesus and him alone to save you. And that's the good news. And we have to know that about God. We have to know that in His kindness, He is waiting. And we have to go out to a lost and dying world around us and let them know about the kindness of God that is waiting, that He is tearing so that they might repent and believe, that they might come to faith and be saved from the justice of God by the love of God. God sent Jesus to save us from God. Think about that. God sent Jesus to save us from Him. And we have that good news to tell the people. But we have to believe that. We can't have this theology that says, well, God is just love and everybody will ultimately make it to heaven. I saw a clip just yesterday of the Pope saying something about, well, you know, kind of all these roads lead to the same place at the end of the day. That's not what the Bible says. That's bad theology, right? That's not biblical theology. Because biblical theology says, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and life, that no one comes to the Father except through me. That there's one way to heaven, and it's Jesus. Number five, so we've seen that God is the creator, that he is just, that he is loving, that he is kind. Number five, I want to say this, Jesus is Lord. Therefore, we must obey his commands. Jesus is Lord. He's the Lord of our life. If you believe and have accepted and acknowledged those first four points, right? If you've repented of your sins and you've trusted in Jesus, you've been adopted into the family of God as sons of God, co-heirs with Christ, ones who are going to receive his inheritance when it comes, if that's true of you, 
then you also have to recognize that it's not a, a get out of jail, a get out of hell free card. It's not fire insurance. It's not, okay, I said this prayer and now I'm saved. And then the rest of my life, I can just do whatever I want to do because I, I got that taken care of. And so now I'm, I'm free to, to do whatever. And it doesn't matter because I'm saved because that's not good theology either. Because the theology of the Bible says that Jesus is Lord. And that when we are saved, we remove ourselves from the throne of our life and we put Jesus on the throne. And guess what? There, it should be an impossible sentence to say, no, Lord. That should be an impossible sentence. Because if there's a Lord over your life and there's someone in authority over you, um, you can't say no, right? If they're a sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing God, no isn't an option. Jesus says in John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And in James chapter 1, we saw when we were studying James, James tells us not to be a hearer only of the word, but to be a doer also. You see, being a Christian means we have acknowledged God's our creator that puts a standard on us, that we have sinned and separated ourselves from God, and that we will be punished for that. But God loved us, that he sent us a way out through his son, and that if we repent and believe, we can be made right with God. But it doesn't stop there. The Christian life doesn't stop there. That's the beginning. That's why when we do these baptisms, we ask three questions. Not just have you trusted Jesus and not just are you walking with him today, but are you committing to continue to walk with him? Because it's a lifelong journey that we find ourselves on. And that journey puts Jesus in the, in the throne of our life and he is the Lord. And if Jesus is Lord, then we must obey our Lord and do what he says. And that leads us back to the word because that's where we find out what he has demanded of us. And so this is what God is like. If we're going to have a good theology, a biblical theology, this is what's true about God. What we've just seen from his word and that is the foundation by which we build everything else on top of that is true about God. This is what God is like. Not just because I say so. Not just because this is what I want him to be like or I like to think of him as like. But this is who God is because this is who God told us he is. This is what he has told us about himself. And we can't believe contrary to that and worship him truly. When we do that, we begin to worship ourselves. The God made by us, the God made in our image. And so today is a day that you can get your theology lined up, right? Today is the day that we can work out what does the Bible say is true about God and myself. Because in a moment we're going to stand, we're going to sing a song of response, and this is a chance where if you have never repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus, you can do that. This is an opportunity if you've never had true, right belief about God based on what he's told us about himself. You can come and we can talk about that and we can get that right. Maybe you followed Jesus, but you've never followed him fully in baptism, which is what he requires of us. That's what he asks of us. If he's the Lord of your life, then you need to follow him in that. He was baptized for us as an, he was baptized as an example for us and then gives us that command in his great commission. Go and make disciples and baptize them. If we're going to let him be the Lord of our life, we have to be obedient even in the most simple act of being baptized and being a part of a fellowship, being a part of a body, being a part of a church. So you have that opportunity today if the Spirit of God is speaking to you to respond in a way that he is leading you. In a way that is pleasing to him, in a way that gives him the proper honor and credit that he is doing. I'd be happy to pray with you as well. If you just have a, a, some, something weighing heavy on you and you'd like me to pray with you, I'd be happy to do that as well. But however God is leading you, I would encourage you to, to not suppress the Spirit's leading in your life, but to respond as he leads. So let's stand together as we pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We confess that. What I just said at the beginning of this prayer is true, that you are the Lord. And we want to be your people. We want to be obedient to what you called us to. And the only way we can know what that is is by looking in your word. So, Father, help us to have a biblical understanding of who you are. 
And Lord, let us live as if that's true. Let us live that out in our practical life as we share with others, as we talk to others, as we live with others, as we love others around us. Let us do that in a way that's honoring and pleasing to you. Lord, be with us now in this time of response. Or we would respond as your spirit leads. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And number 500. And number 500. So, Caleb and Julianne come uh, by transfer of letter from the Like Minded Baptist Church. So, we'll get all that um, worked out. But if you rejoice in what the Lord's doing with all of this, say amen. 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 Let me give you a few quick reminders. They're going to stay up here too, so I'm coming. Welcome them. But let me give you a few reminders. You don't have to have a long conversation this morning. We're having a meet, greet, and treat from 3 to 5 p.m. in the Maverick Room. So, if you want to you know, ask all the questions you want and have a long conversation, Let's do all that, three to five. They're on Eastern time, so their stomachs are telling them it's 1251, not 1151. So, but um, but come and welcome them. Come back three to five, bring a little housewarming something for their pantry uh, uh, for them. And then next Sunday evening, we're having a youth fellowship and youth and youth parents fellowship at the Harrelsons at uh, Heath and Alex's house. So we'll do more info about that this week and all that. But plenty of opportunities for everybody to, to get Caleb and Julianne and welcome them. So I'm going to pray to dismiss us and then come and uh, congratulate Hayes and welcome the Newsom. So let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for the grace that you show us in Jesus and we're thankful for how you're working in our church as is illustrated here before us. We just pray that you continue to work among us and Lord that we might um, reach our city. Uh, for you, and that we might be a, a big part of what you're doing here among us. Uh, Lord, just be with us as we leave this place. Help us to share those truths we know to be true about you with others that we encounter. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.